welcome everyone. Welcome to this webinar on regenerative eco lodges in Africa. We're going to get started. So unfortunately for this webinar, we didn't have a sponsor. So if you are aware of somebody that wants or a company that wants to sponsor this event, uh, please let us know. It's not big money, but it's really to cover the cost for the CPD validation. So any suggestions are welcome or if you run a company that can collaborate or co contribute to this webinar series, please let us know. So seeing that we don't have a sponsor this time, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Regenerative Collaborative of South Africa. We are a non-profit organization and we currently run it as volunteers. We have three directors, which is Tulani Kuzwayo and me, Malus Reining, and Adele Hoskin. And we're trying to run the collaborative from a strategic level. And then the very important committee that we're having is the events committee, which is headed by me. And uh, we have Lisette on the sponsorship and Janice on the CPD admin and Milan on the social media. And if you want to contribute or help or assist or volunteer, please let us know. We can always use help in organizing these, these webinars. And also, I just wanted to just reflect back on the year. I know this is the last webinar of the year and we've come a long way. We've done 11 webinars, including this one this year, and we've consistently did every last Thursday of the month. In January, we talked about mass timber, which was part two, which was a follow up on the November one, uh, which was very well attended. And we touched on like many, many different concepts related to regenerative design. And we had some interviews with very exciting people like Wayne Fisser on thriving, which was a very interesting webinar. And we had one on one planet, which we will touch on again today as well. And if you want to relook at these webinars again, then go to the Greennet website. They're still available for CPD points, so you can have a relook at them and apply for your CPD points. Yeah, and let us know what you want to hear about next year. We are planning on doing another 11 next year, so let us know. Keep us keep us up to date with what you want to hear and learn about related to regenerative design. So again, this webinar is organized by the Regenerative Collaborative South Africa. You can follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn or email us on regenerativecollaborativesa at gmail.com. Again, if you want to have your input or you want to and want us to touch on a topic that is close to your heart, you can even win 500 Rand by giving us your description, your title and your topic and potential speakers or sponsors. And I'll share this link in the, in the chat just now. So, but today we're talking about regenerative ecologies in Africa, and we have two really amazing speakers. I have seen the presentations already, so I'm really excited for these presentations. First up, we have Nick Pluman, and he's the owner of Pluman Architects, and he has a lifetime passion for the wilderness, which is definitely visible from his work. He's got over 20 years of design and project management experience in remote and sensitive environments. His beautiful design respects nature and culture and are uncompromising ecological responsible. And I, I practiced this word a couple of times before this webinar. I still can't get it out of my mouth, probably. Apologies for that. Um, his designs are energy neutral and sustainably resourced. He's designed the Sandibia Lodge, which is definitely one of the most stunning lodges, in my opinion, ecologically restorative designs that I've come across. And he will show us how he considers nature and culture when designing these remote eco lodges. And then after Nick, we have Ben Gill, who will then take over and run us through the more practical side of running an eco lodge. And Ben works for Bioregional and has been working in the sustainability field for 20 years. He started off with a wrapping robot to teach primary school children about recycling. <laughs> so I'd, lo I'd love to hear more about that one before you start presenting. And probably more serious, he's, he's played a key role in developing the One Living Planet framework. And he's really going to share his experience with working one, with one of his clients, Sinkita Lodge, in applying this framework to integrate sustainability in the operations of the lodges. So really, 
Thank you for being here. Thank you for volunteering your time to us and sharing your experience with us. So I'm going to hand over to Nick, and he's going to share his screen with us. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Malus, for the invitation to participate in this webinar. It's a privilege to be part of a discussion. It means a lot to me. I think you've introduced me and I don't have to say, therefore, too much more. I've, I've had the privilege of working in amazing corners of the world, building buildings that most architects um, wish they could be involved in and how I came to do that's a long story, but I'm not going to go into here. But over a couple of decades, we've, we've had a great deal of fun in some very exciting places. And I'm just going to run through very quickly, just, just a couple of projects, not uh, too many, to try and kind of take you through the thought process, really, that has kind of led to the kind of buildings we've done in different places. This, in fact, is not one of our buildings, but I wish it was, because it seems to me to be a near perfect response to its environment, not just in terms of its uh, materiality, but because it's kind of very fabric and design and aesthetic, seems to speak the language of the environment around it. And if I had to kind of look at a sort of icon building that I would, you know, see as a kind of inspiring, not so much what to design, but how to design, a building in places, uh, in remote places, this would, this would be it. Building in remote places obviously has challenges and the whole notion of how you respect the environment is really the issue that, that I want to tackle. And, and how do you build something often on a greenfield site, not always, but often on a, on a greenfield site where there's been no human footprint beforehand you go into it with really very tentatively, you know, and very, uh, you need to go into it with a very great deal of respect for, for what's there. Because once you put your foot down in it, it's there forever or nearly ever. If you're very lucky, you might build something that might disappear in, over the eons, but, but mostly you've created a footprint where there was nothing before. And trying to kind of tease out a design that is appropriate in all these different places and that speaks to that environment and is enhancing of the environment and maybe tells a bit of a story about that environment is what we try to do. So by and large, we can talk and I can certainly answer questions later about the actual materiality and sustainability and off-grid solutions and all of those kind of things. But I think those are those are sort of more than obvious to everybody. So I, I kind of am tackling this little talk on a on the basis of a slightly more aesthetic kind of approach to things. How 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 do we go about coming up with a a building that speaks to its environment? So I'm going to run you through a couple of countries, just different approaches we've taken in different places. In particular. I'm just going to start with, uh, come up with, a, with a, a sort of expression, which is kind of just, well, I'm going to call it for the purposes of this discussion, um, sensing the environment and trying to kind of tease a design out of it. Our design for Sandibi Lodge in the Okavango Delta in Botswana got a lot of attention and, and therefore many, many people know it. So please excuse me for bringing it up again, but it's perhaps in some ways the best example I, I have of, in our own work of trying to find something where my response to the environment was inchoate. You couldn't really put it into words and you had to sort of latch onto something that could be the start of a narrative about a place and from which you could build up a design. I thought it'd be fun. I'll just take you through. These really are my very kind of on the on the left hand side, very very early sketches in response to the idea that we would choose this leet motif of a of a pangolin for the for the building, the way it sort of curled around itself and 
protected itself from the environment, but then also could open up again and those scales could reopen to inhabit the environment uh, it found itself in. Uh, this project was done in very close collaboration with an English firm of architects, Michaelis Boyd Associates. So it would be very clear that they are equally they are equal authors of the project. And one of my other projects, I'll show you a bit later, they were involved and we're busy working with them again now on some new projects. So you can see how our drawing sort of began to tease itself into, into something that was just a response to the forest that didn't draw its precedent from anywhere else. Really important to me to try and that a building kind of grows organically out of its site. In this instance, the building is, will, hopefully, one day. It's not built to last. It's, it's just a wonderful little shelter that hopefully eventually will become a, a carcass of itself and just rot away back into the forest floor. But the language of the forest floor and of animals that live and die there, and the leaves and the wood chips that accumulate on the forest floor are what we try to build make the building manifest in architecture. Quite a, an important thing in hospitality architecture, I think, that the building isn't the whole experience. You know, mostly when people go to wherever, Tulum in Mexico, they're going to go to the beach and they're going to have a building. The building is not the, doesn't have to be the hero. The building is just a frame work for an experience. But if we can make that frame a very, very beautiful frame, then, then the experience itself is, uh, is enhanced. More recently, we've done a little project in Rwanda where we had to build a, a little boutique hotel, the, the purpose of which was to, to host people go to trek and see gorillas. I mean, it's a life seeing gorillas being near these kind of near closest living animal relatives of ours is a life-changing experience. Simply one of the most remarkable things I've ever, I've ever done in my life. And sort of feeling that one had to sort of, you know, try to honor something, build something that we, of course, you wanted it to be unusual and a bit unique, but I wanted more than that. I wanted to sort of drill down sort of into my own kind of just subconscious perception of what it meant to be a gorilla on these, on these steep, steep slopes of the Virunga, the Virunga mountains and come up with the design again. It didn't, you know, didn't really draw its precedent from anywhere else. And so we sort of sketched and played around and really what we're trying to do is just sort of, you know, make gorillas themselves take one step forward and, and build the, the habitation that they might have built for themselves. In, in doing so, we also drew on some vernacular tradition in Rwanda, there is a sort of an old traditional building methodology amongst the Watusi people of, of Rwanda, and, and we looked at that, that kind of architectural precedent. I, I never diss architectural precedent. I, I think it's really important. I think the vernacular that people produce is generally a pretty good response to the environment. And it's often very honest and makes that communication, that direct visual link with its environment, because it's you very often was built of the materials that were available in the place. And I, I'm going to come back to this image in a way, because I think I'm going to just take you straight into the, you know, the interior, the, the, the kind of habitation we were, we were trying to create, which was this idea of a nest almost floating in a forest or on a hillside. And it had lots of other pressures on it, the project at least a you know, sort of tight time frame, small budget, all the usual kind of things. It is, after all, a building designed to create a hospitality industry, uh, some sort of return on investment. But the, if I just flick back the, to that very first image, when it was all done and built, and really this is, if it was intended, it was subconscious, but in, in a curious kind of way, when it was all done, and we look back up at these buildings on this very steep volcano. It was a bit like that first image I showed you, peering deep into the eyes of a of a gorilla, looking out, looking at those eyes from below those kind of heavily lidded eyebrows, peering out uh, in that very uh, what's the right word? Sort of reticent way that gorillas sit and look at you, 
there was something that resonated with our finished building with that expression, which we hadn't completely intended. It just turned out that way. And it'll build a very, very different kind of building. This is a, a very high-end home that is uh, rented out for hosp hospitality, quite a popular hospitality model now across Africa, or sort of high-end sole-use villas where people come with their families and, and spend, you know, a week or two or three. And this environment was the Laikipia Plateau of Kenya, looking toward Mount Kenya in the, in the, dif in the distance. Absolutely beautiful, beautiful environment. Um, it's, it's what Midrand would have looked like 250 years ago. Just really tremendous. And what makes it special is, this, is how gentle it is and how subdued in a way this landscape is. And it's just these rolling hills of grassland, nothing screaming and shouting at you. And we wanted to build a, a home that spoke to that. This project also done was in collaboration with our English architect colleagues, Michaelis Boyd. It was a, a four year labor of love in the making. And we're very lucky to have had an incredible builder building it as well. We had a real sense of the of the kind of fabric we were after. And in the end, it was all about the textures and responding to the textures of the place, but not in a corny way, in a way that was perhaps not unusual for unusual sake, but just had a kind of almost monastic quality to it. And it was something our client wanted, it was quite interesting, sort of a cloister approach to the planning. And it all was cut down into the rock. That rock at that entrance in the distance is the bedrock. And you walk in over the bedrock into, into this home underneath these big grass turf roofs and the house can't be seen from anywhere, but it looks out on the world. So not necessary to be organic, necessary to be organic. I think this is as organic a response to the environment as our more curvilinear and wavy organic forms. Recently, we did a project in the Sabi Sands in Mpumalanga for a, well, the project, the, the, the client is, uh, is an owner of a large property there. Uh, the operator is a very well-known uh, operator with whom we've worked on many projects. And the project is called Tengile. And there, you know, the Sambi Sands, quite, there's, there's a lot going on in the Sambi Sands, lots of competition, lots of other projects. A whole original sort of, you know, Bushveld vernacular of thatch, sort of lodges that really kind of pretty much inspired the whole lodge industry. And it's why, you know, sort of most lodges in South Africa went on to kind of be a one form or another of the same thing with kind of thatch roofs and, um, and lots of rough wood and, and so on and gum poles and stuff. And we, I kind of felt that we needed to look at it in a different, in a different sort of a way. And I, I trying to find some inspiration. In the end, I thought, well, let's just zoom out a bit. And we sort of, the, the site we were given was on the bend of a river, a very sharp kind of right angle bend on the river. And it meant that you could look kind of north and east at the same time. And the idea of this axial arrangement of buildings that could look east and north um, all the time started to kind of say something. And then sort of zooming out into space and looking at it on Google Earth. And then you could see there was this kind of near, very interesting geomorphological grid sort of in the geomorphology in the in the bedrock and that's indeed why as as erosion eroded out those hard and soft parts of the earth's crust why the, the river had this form and made these sharp right angle bends as it followed one sort of stress line or whatever in, in the earth and then uh, turned to go in, into another and so our, our sort of starting point was kind of just trying to think well let's Let's work with that to a very sort of linear orthogonal thing to look at our planning. And then the other inspiration, which I don't have an image of, is that there's a railway line that runs through the, that was built by hand many, many, many years ago, now defunct, no longer operating. But that's how 
certainly most of the sort of pioneers and early farmers and early hunters and so on got into that part of the world was up this Salati railway line. And the language of the railway line seemed quite an interesting potential avenue for for doing something. And so looking at, at the stone and iron and wood and steel that, that the building was built of, uh, that the railway line was built of, I beg your pardon, seemed a, a departure point for the design. And in the end, quite a sort of, I don't know, for want of a better way of putting it, you know, quite a kind of hard lined, quite rectilinear building following the, the lines and the geomorphology and just working with these three materials, steel, rusted and not stone, and, old rail, and re repurposed old railway sleepers. Just an aside, if I sort of zoom in, the floors are all polished concrete, and, and to give them a little bit of character, we thought we'll, we'll get the aggregate from the railway line, and we'll use that in the concrete, and because it's bigger and, you know, just whatever, than bigger stones than you would get in conventional concrete. And we cast them, and then we polished them and rubbed them down, and as you started applying the finest level of polish, this whole amazing thing happened, which was that every stone almost was a different color. And that would never happen in conventional concrete aggregate. And it took a little while to kind of work out. So why was that? Why, was, why were all of these stones different colors? And of course it was that the railway was built by hand. And Shangan workers, you know, brought on to build that railway were sent out to quarry rock with picks and shovels by hand in different parts of the low felt. And that's a completely forgotten story, the sort of literacy of which suddenly emerged in our floors. Otherwise, you can see it, re it retains a kind of a low felt vernacular of big stoops and, um, you know, a sort of sprawling building. So we haven't completely lost that vernacular tradition in trying to do something a, 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 little, a little different. I think the finished finish building in its environment Hopefully it doesn't offend, it doesn't dominate its environment, it sublimates itself to its environment, and maybe in its own quiet way tells tells a story. I thought, I know we're supposed to be speaking about Africa here, but I, I, I couldn't help myself, I thought I'd just quickly show you a, a project in a completely different environment, really is just by way of contrast. We recently did in a collaboration with an interiors firm we work with a lot, Fox Brown Creative, we did a, a really big resort project in Gujarat in India. It's the first really high-end destination in that area. People go there to see the Asian lion, which is, which is a very interesting animal. And, you know, a completely different environment to have to find inspiration and work. I mean, very heavily populated, ancient, rural, poor. You've got this, this amazing kind of pattern of, of forest and village and um, habit, you know, human habitation and agriculture and wildlife, all just in a great big mad mix. It's completely crazy. I mean, you know, the lions make, will make a kill in the middle of a street like that. They'll come and kill an ox or something like that. And everybody stands around and watches it from afar. But the villagers love the lions because the lions also eat the spotted deer that eat their crops. And, of course, they become a sort of icon for them. And there's hu huge respect for them. So, again, trying to find, like, what is it? What's that little thing that, that starts to kind of be a way of, of looking at the project? And we were given this site, which was insane. In the middle of a patent patchwork of forest, we were given a field that didn't have a single, it was a five acre field, not one tree on it, nothing. Oh, sorry, one tree right in the middle, one little kind of spindly tea tree. And it was like, I was kind of completely flummoxed for a while. And then spending time going into these villages, which are called, a village like I was called a ness. And these people have been living in an incredible sort of symbiotic relationship with the wild and the forest. I mean, they literally whistle the lions in to come and chase or eat the chittal that have got into their wheat fields. They can whistle like a chittal and make the, that will attract the lions to come and chase the wildlife out of, their, out of their fields. And they're growing, I mean, it's just amazing variety of crops and incredible food. And so we 
we look to that as our kind of inspiration. And, and in the end, instead of taking that approach of disappearing into the forest, because uh, that was impossible on a blank field, I'm going to come back to this image of the leaf. I just wanted to bring it in there. I'll show you in a little while. We had to rebuild this field into something. We created a, we created a village with its traditional a sort of great house uh, called a Haveli in India and an almost urban street that you kind of walk down the your circulation was down this kind of old, old street into your particular room which was or quarters it was really a, a almost a little mini house on its own called a Koti in, in India and once you were in your Koti you looked out at the forest around you and, and then on this old completely barren barren field we replanted it into both incredible gardens that provide all the vegetables and fruit and for the hotel, and then we rewilded a portion of it as well, so that the whole thing in itself became a, a sort of living symbol of what was so spectacular about conservation in this part of India. And it's very typically Indian, very sort of lavish and over the top and, and lots of fun. But at the same time, built with materials like limestone quarried, uh, you know, near, very nearby, very traditional kind of buildings, very more contemporary building, but made with traditional local materials. And, and I, I said that leaf, if you remember the pattern in that leaf, the, the, it's a teak leaf, and these the teak, the teak trees that grow in the, in the surrounding forests, when they die, the sort of green part of the leaf very, is very quickly eaten away by by microbes and things. Leap, but the but the spines and all the little veins are, are harder at last. And you get these beautiful sort of leaves that are a kind of pattern of themselves. And we looked deep into that structure. It's one of the places we found our inspiration for these what are called jolly screens that we then rendered in Corten in the one hand and actually had them uh, sort of water jet blasted into stone to create these massive walls. So just a, another little interesting way of finding, in, in, you know, so it was a sort of, in the end, uh, yeah, a kind of a combination of drawing on nature, uh, drawing on vernacular tradition, having some fun in the process, and hopefully creating a framework for guests who come there to kind of dig in at a subconscious level in, into what makes conservation in the, in the era that, they, that, that they've come to enjoy. It's so special. And a typical village street and a access to a room and that's really that's it that's a, a very short kind of overview very very just brief you know a couple of examples of, of things we've done and this little building we did many 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 years ago in the eastern cape where it seemed that uh you know it seemed appropriate for the for the environment of the uh, this is sunday's river valley and that that whole old settler part of the eastern cape so thank you very much for listening to my rambles. I'll happily pick up, as I say, any, any questions later on the actual materiality and sort of technical aspects of all the, of all the projects. So all, almost all of them are sustainable from, a, you know, in terms of power generation and so on. Not completely all. Some, for practical reasons, aren't, but, but many are. But those are all sort of technical things that we're all familiar with and you would all be familiar with certain things necessary to bore you with them completely. I think I think you're making some assumptions here that are not completely <laughs> true, but thank you, Nick. That was a lovely presentation. I think it was it's good to hear it from an architect's perspective. And I think we we usually have a lot of architects on the call. So I think they, they really appreciated it. And just before we go on to uh, Ben's talk, I have one question and I'm gonna take my uh, liberties as, as a facilitator here. You very briefly mentioned, and I think it's quite important to emphasize that, is that, you know, when you look at the at the traditional architecture, the vernacular architecture, you usually come up with the best solution from a, like a climate and material perspective. Yep. Would you be able to like to share like a little bit more about this? Because I think it is really important and pop and, and I feel often we forget about that, that we should actually look back at what was the previously before we you know we before we start designing well well you must look to why it was built that way to my mind not necessarily just how it was built or, or what was built and uh, because you get all the clues to an environmental response in that but, you know so stoop the great big veranda stoop architecture is a south african icon for jolly good reason you know we live under a hot sun 
we're get, retreating into the shade of a wide veranda and stopping the solar gain along your window line and wall line by having deep eaves is a, a sort of critical way to make a building perform better thermally. So there are clues in that. And, and even those very old ones, you know, even the old Himba hat that I showed right in the beginning has an environmental response because it's a, it's a, it's a thick shell of mud that will simply has, you know, keep the sun out. And as the sun um, bakes on it over a day, it's, it's, it's kind of thick enough that it acts as a bit of a heat sink. And you can see at the bottom all the little sticks along the edge that let air in and out at the bottom to help the building to sort of breathe. Um, so I, I just thought it was a terrific piece of vernacular, you know, architecture. Uh, but the mistake that gets made, has been made a lot, is to think that then if you parody that or imitate it or create a kind of a, you know, a sort of a simulacrum, or do a sort of Disneyfication of the thing, that you're doing it with the same climatic response, because you probably aren't, because you're looking then just at the physical form of the thing. You've attached a romantic notion to it. I, I'm more interested in the... I'm not going to completely just the romantic notion, but I'm more interested in why it was done than the kind of aesthetic that, mm. it, that it created. And, and you know, it, you can just end up with, as I certainly think, particularly Bushveld's architecture in South Africa for... It's now stepping out of it a bit mm, with a few missteps here and there. It's, you know, you, you ended up with just a, a sort of very passe sort of pastiche, that's the word I want, of, of something that had been done before, rather than genuinely tackled it on the merits of its environmental response. Right. Great, thank you. I'm going to hand over to oh, Ben. Um, so shall I, I'll, I'll launch in, shall I? Yeah, go for it. Just, I, before I start, Nick really enjoyed that. I was fortunate enough, actually, working on projects in Rwanda to uh, visit Bisate, I think it's called, yeah. the the, 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 um, the nests. And yeah, I mean, absolutely, yeah. absolutely stunning spot, beautiful architecture. So yeah, congratulations, really, really great job. So I was uh, introduced earlier, if you would like me to talk about going to primary schools with a wrapping robot made from recycled material, I'll do that later. But just I work at Bioregional. I've been at Bioregional part time in the last few years for over 15 years, probably, and been working in the sustainability sector for 20 years. I did an undergraduate in earth science at Cambridge and a postgraduate in, in environmental technology, and then been working in the sustainability sector since then. Just to explain who Bioregional are so it's a charity and a social enterprise that was founded getting on for 30 years ago now by uh, Sue and Puran, who I work with closely, who've both been awarded uh, Orders of the British Empire by the Queen for their work on sustainability. And although we're a, a social enterprise, we've worked increasingly with a lot of uh, organisations to help them embed sustainability. These are both private organisations, local governments, developers, re real estate and built up a you know, great experience in, in, in looking at how you take sustainability and embed it into a project. Just to maybe explain a little bit of where we came from. So the first sort of experiment by regional had in uh, sustainable construction and, and operations is, is the bed Z development in South London, which was completed getting on for 20 years, years ago now. It's 100 homes in South London. It was the first designed to be zero carbon development uh, in the UK. It's had great success in terms of reducing energy and um, uh, energy and water use. It had the first uh, car club in the UK, so the car share scheme, which have now become common you know, across much of the continent. I'm not sure, don't know about in, in, in South Africa. And also initiatives were taken to link to local farmers, uh, help residents reduce waste and actually had um, a green lifestyle officer to work with residents when, the, when they moved in uh, to, the, to the development. And it was really successful from an environmental perspective, possibly more successful from a social perspective. Uh, we found that the average resident of, of 
in the UK knows eight of their neighbours by name. The average resident of Bed Z knows about 20 neighbours by name. So for us, it was a real success story that we set out to develop a, a sustainable development and we actually created or an environmentally sustainable development and we created a very socially sustainable one. What we did think was that if we built Bed Z, everyone living there would live a truly sustainable lifestyle. And we wanted to test this afterwards and started using ecological footprint as, as a way of measuring that, which really just looks at an individual's resource use and turns it into a land area. Uh, and given that we know how much land is available on the earth, we can kind of see, are we using a sustainable amount of land? And we found that the average resident or well, the average person in the UK requires about three planets worth of resources. We thought that this would reduce to one for a resident of Bed Z, but actually it only reduces down to two. So we've saved a planet, but obviously we need to save the other planet as well. And this was primarily because you can't, uh, you can live a one planet lifestyle at, at Bed Z as long as you never leave. But the problem is most people have to go to work or to school or the shops and they move out of their sort of one planet house into a three planet world. And this really highlighted the need to look more broadly than just the buildings, but really start helping address people's lifestyle as a whole. And I think this is reinforced by if you look at an individual's uh, ecological footprint, you know, we can see that although so the the graph here shows a breakdown of that ecological footprint going housing transport food goods and, and and services and so there's a lot of focus on reducing the carbon emissions of of buildings you know, increasingly how, how do we reduce the impact of transport but we can see that actually the impact of the food we eat and the stuff we buy is as important as how we power our houses on how we, we transport ourselves. So we actually need to look at all lifestyle aspects, not, not just buildings and, and transport. And this led to the, the framework that we've developed around One Planet Living, which is a vision of the world where everyone enjoys happy and healthy lifestyle within the, the limits of the planet. We use the One Planet Living framework in, in three ways. So it's it's a vision that kind of anyone can subscribe to. So it's it's open source and anyone can use this vision. There's then a, a framework which I'll come on to, which helps people develop sustainability uh, strategies and people can use that framework. And then if you want to be recognized as a leader in One Planet Living, there's a process for, for that, uh, for that um, in terms of uh, publishing uh, your, your strategy, making it publicly available uh, uh, and being reviewed uh, so people can see what you've managed to achieve. So we're trying to make, we're trying to create a tool that anyone can use, but ensure that it's uh, an authentic tool and that, that everyone using it is transparent in what they're doing. The framework ex itself is made up of 10 sustainability principles that bring together natural resource use and, and equity, address all, you know, all aspects of sustainability, but in a very uh, easy to understand way. And we're able to use the framework on you know, construction projects, on the construction site when you come to the construction site itself, through to the, the, the operational phase of a development. So it's a really great framework for being able to and deliver technical detailed outputs, but also then look at how you operate a, a building or a project more sustainably. The principles themselves cover you know, the, the aspects of sustainability you, you would expect. When we first developed the principles, we had them the other way up. So zero carbon and zero waste were, were at the top, but we found that while architects and engineers are very interested in, in energy and waste and materials, when you start talking to the end users of a, of a building and you know, ordinary people, they're interested in health and health and well-being and in their local community. And so we've kind of turned them upside down in a way so that when we start working on a project, we encourage and the, the project team to start by looking at the perspective of how we're going to encourage health and well-being uh, in this project. How is that going to be enabled? And I suppose the last kind of fundamental element of our, of our thinking is that we need to understand that everything is connected. So if we 
sort of follow this diagram away uh, around it. If we create uh, communities where uh, you have to use fossil fuel cars, then we're supporting the, the oil industry. If we, a, a byproduct of the oil industry is, is plastics, we now seeing that all of these plastics are, are essentially ending up in the ocean and then ending up in fish. If we choose to eat those fish, they're ending up in our own bodies. And we're seeing that that's having impacts on our ability to absorb oxygen and, and uh, tension. The same time, obviously, emissions contribute to, to climate change, which is having an impact on the uh, ability of the Earth to produce food for us. And all of this is, is then you know, we're do, having these impacts in, in Europe and it's all impacting uh, your penguins in Cape Town, for example, that, that, that end up eating fish that have plastics in them or, or their, their seas, uh, seas are warming. So all of these uh, issues are connected and only when we start trying to address them together are we going to actually be able to, to, to resolve them. So just wanted to then go very much on to the, the example of how we've used this framework and approach to embed sustainability into the Singita projects or, or really help Singita to embed sustainability. We've not just worked with Singita, we've worked on projects all over the world with uh, a number of projects in, in Africa. Uh, so our first project that we worked on was with the Singita Serengeti, which is a a project in, in uh, Tanzania which aims to, to fund conservation through tourism. So there's the it's a partnership between Singita and the Grometi Fund uh, and the Grometi Fund manage 140,000 hectares of, of land that's really bordering on, on uh, the Serengeti National Park and they developed a, a One Planet Living framework to, to look at uh, how how they could manage their operations sustainably because they're doing fantastic conservation and community work, but, but not necessarily operating sustainably. Uh, and they produced six reports now, maybe probably more like seven, um, on the progress that they've made in delivering this goal. So being very transparent and explaining where they've had success and where they've had, um, you know, where they've found it harder to progress. They're already, you know, the work they're doing in conservation is, is fantastic. They've already got 150 or more than that uh, trained local game scouts. There's been a tenfold increase in, in key species. They've actually reintroduced rhino into the area and, and are protecting them. Um, and then the work they do creates a huge amount of local employment, not just directly for people, but in terms of working with the local community to produce the food that, that is that is needed and the other goods that, that are purchased. And then they engage with the community for developing school visits at an eco centre and, and, and on safaris. And as part of this you know, process, we recognise them as being a, a global leader in One Planet Living because we believe that they're addressing all elements of sustainability and communicating this. Some of, the, some of what they've achieved, so they've installed 650 kilowatt peak of solar on the property and all new projects are um, aimed at being zero carbon. The waste, uh, when we first went there, uh, you know, there are no waste and recycling facilities where, where they're, they're based. They have to address, they have to manage all of that themselves. And so when we first went there, you know, quite honestly, waste was not being managed and, and they've now managed to, you know, close to eliminate the use of plastic, reduce that as low as possible and ensure that close to 100% of materials are, are recycled locally by community and ent enterprises. So actually have you know, genuinely created a, a, a circular economy of key materials and products locally. And then some other kind of achievements have been a 20% reduction in, in water use, 15% reduction in vehicle fuel and, and, and flights by monitoring what people are doing, training people, putting in places uh, procedures that people didn't like, like uh, stopping people driving to visit their, their friends when there was a, a bus that will be going later on uh, and just trying to instill different habits in the way people live. And having just a, so the, key, so the key part of this was having tested uh, the, the framework uh, at Singita Serengeti, then this was expanded to the whole of the Singita portfolio across uh, Africa, which has projects in South Africa, Rwanda, 
uh, and then increasingly looking at some other other locations as well. And what we a, a starting point was to work with with uh, the team to set out a very clear strategy. So we try to use the same kind of same language, the same approach on on all plans, trying to make it as as simple as as possible. We state very clearly what the outcomes are, what that we want to achieve, what are, what are the goals, and have as far as possible, you know, very aspirational outcomes. And then the indicators that we're going to use to track our progress and the actions we're going to have to deliver those. So we've got a you know, high level vision going down to a much more detailed set, set of actions. And the delivery of the of the, the plan, you know, we have uh, actions for each of the 10 principles, but sort of broken it down here to look at retrofit of existing buildings, um, standards for new construction, procurement initiatives, staff training and, and behaviour change and also engagement uh, with, with guests. So one of the starting points was looking at improving the, the infrastructure of existing buildings. So all projects now have re renewable energy. The Sigita Kruger National Park is run 100% on, on solar energy or close to there is, there is diesel for, for backup. So all, all new projects will now have renewable energy putting a focus on you know the obvious uh, issues of just making it them as efficient as, as possible in terms of cooling and surprisingly heating so the Rwanda project re requires heating using certification schemes where possible where relevant so the project in Tanzania had the first uh, lead building in Tanzania or in rural Tanzania or first lead building some, somewhere but use that framework to, to to ensure that the construction you know, followed best practice where possible. The existing projects have been looking at how it went in, how can we make the, those, those easy wins, changing all of the, the, the light bulbs, and changing all of the upgrading, all of the air conditioning units. For the some of the older properties, there was huge water loss. So having to replace water pipes, put in metering to find the um, uh, find the leaks and then looking at and, and using all refurbishment projects as a way of driving this efficiency upgrade, but then ensuring as, as far as possible that fit out is driven by local sourcing, which means although Singita works internationally, trying to have a real national and regional focus for, for all of the all of the projects. Um, this lovely picture is from a project in Zimbabwe and I think 60% of all the materials uh, in the project came from sort of very close to the project itself. From a procurement perspective, the procurement team have developed a One Planet Living sustainability matrix to, to review all of their procurements, then simplified it to look at well what are the most high value or who which suppliers do we spend most money with which of those suppliers has products which are you know, likely to have an environmental impact and which ones of those do we actually have any uh, any leverage over who can we engage with to make them change and so by doing that they identified you know, a number of suppliers who they could they could engage with uh, and then try and improve their performance help them find alternative materials, organic sources for uniforms and, and canvas for tents, and then setting you know, basic sustainability requirements and standards on all procurements. From an operational perspective, it's been really about trying to engage with the staff from, this is just the parallel I, I take with this was in the UK, so that everyone, uh, the average person in the UK leads leads a three planet lifestyle. It's not that they wake up in the morning and, and think, you know, I'm going to use three planets worth of resources today. It's just that their the system they live in, their habits, that all leads them to, to live in this way. So we need to look at how we can change that system and, and change their, their people's habits. So there's on each on each site there's a one planet living champion who coordinates you know th this activity they're supported by a committee of people who who um, put in place you know in initiatives and events and everyone receives a, a training in one planet living so all staff have been trained in one planet living and actually you know one of the first times that i went to that well, the second time i went to visit the project in, in tanzania to do to do a review of how they were getting on 
as I arrived, I ended up sharing a, a lift with with a, a housekeeper and um, my Swahili is not very good. Uh, her English wasn't great either. So we were trying to have a conversation. So I said, oh, I, I'm from One Planet. And she said, ah, One Planet, reduce, reuse, recycle. And it was just really great to hear that, that you know, that, that, you know, a housekeeper un understood how sustainability had been made relevant to their job. They, they saw what they had to do in, in this and that it was about everyone working together. One of the real focuses we've had in this is looking at choices we make in our, in our own life. So highlighting that food is about 20% of an individual's uh, ecological footprint and meat and dairy produce is, is the most significant contributor to that. Actually looking at can we get people to, to, to re reduce their or eat a more self, uh, sustainable diet, which is actually much better for our, our health as well. In, in some locations where there's minimal facilities and I mean just just for the environment they've run reusable nappy projects to enable the people living there to you reuse nappies because uh, the average baby makes about a ton of, of, of nappy waste all of which ends up in landfill and then it's just been a process of really trying to learn from each other um, so the image on the on top left of it is the recycling center in Zimbabwe which is yeah, as you can see, is a place you could hold a meeting if you wanted to. So it's, they did this through having regular waste audits, reviews of, of each area, and that approach has then been replicated across the different sites. From a procurement perspective, there's been some engagement with the waste contractor, in South Africa, a lady called Happiness. She came and gave a talk at, at the, the sites, you know, explaining what happens to the waste afterwards. It's like if you don't sort the waste here, my ladies later have to sort it all out. You know, this is it's not that it's someone else deals with it. I deal with it and, and the people I work with. So just trying to make people understand that uh, supporting local farmers. So, so working with a farmer to set up a farm. The procurement team done a great job on looking at how they can eliminate plastic in the in their supply chain. So reusable uh, containers for the transport or alternatives to that's not meant to say tap. That's meant to say tape. So instead of a uh, packaging tape, they've got a, a paper gum tape uh, that's used. And then looking with the guests, there's now a, a carbon offset levy on, on all guests so that there's been a you know, in minor increase in the cost of the stay and that is used to offset the carbon emissions. But I think more importantly is, is about trying to, when, when the guests arrive, many of them are desperate to see the big five and that's understandable. How do we help them kind of slow down, get into maybe just trying to experience being in the bush uh, as an experience in itself rather than wanting to, to drive around chasing those uh, iconic animals? And then final slide, sitting behind this is just, you know, it's really important to understand what's going on, to be transparent and, and, and honest about this. So Singita also publishes a public document on their sustainability performance each year. There's a internal tracking quarterly down of, of, of carbon emissions, and that's shared between the lodges so other people can learn from what, what, what's going on. Carbon footprints monitored each year and, and it sort of expanded what's included. So trying to expand more of the, of the uh, procurement side of things to understand where the impact is. And recently been experimenting using a, a, a digital tool called One Planet that I also work with. So it's an enterprise set up by Bioregional and spun out of Bioregional, which is really a, a networking tool that enables us to, to understand the linkages between different sustainable actions and their different impacts of sustainability. So how do actions link to both carbon and to health or link to health and the local economy so that we can find which actions are going to have the most beneficial impact across all of these areas, but also then networks what's going across on going on on all of the, the, the sites uh, so we can see you know, the performance um, and the progress in each of the different areas, but to have that all consolidated in, in one place. So that's been a really kind of rapid explanation of what One Planet Living is and how Singita have, have used it to try and embed sustainability in their work. And just sort of the final slide, it's working with you know, sustainability in the conservation team. It is 
amazing to see that the work that's been done in, in conservation. So these are uh, rhinos that were raised, were born in one of the uh, conservation areas that St Geeta is involved in managing and the population is now beyond the carrying capacity of the site and they've been moved to another park in Zimbabwe. Rhino are being repopulated there. So it's yeah, this, this whole story is not, not just about sustainability, but also about conservation and, and community as well. I'm sorry, I went on a bit long. But... No, not at all. Thank you so much. That was uh, super inspirational. And, and it's really nice to see that the, that the Lodge is taking it seriously and really making those steps towards like these improvements into conservation and, and, and integrating it with the community and, and their guests, because in the end, the guests also need to learn about all these things, I would imagine. I'm going to open the floor for questions. So if you have a question, put up your hand, raise your hand, and I can unmute you. I was expecting that one already. I'll unmute you, Marty. There you go. You can, you can unmute yourself now. How's it, everyone? Thanks, uh, everyone who was involved with the talk. I'm not too sure if Nick is still on. <coughs> So hopefully it is, um, but I, I think one of the points that he made was he would like, and yeah, how's it, Nick, it's been a while, uh, but one of the points he made was you would like it to eventually dissolve or, or be eaten up by microbes in your building. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> as an owner of a building, that's not exactly what I want to um, <laughs> necessarily hear, but I mean, is there, in my mind, there's a, a mix between being able to disassemble it and reuse it as opposed it's as opposed to it's biodegrading Hi, itself into nothing just joe your thoughts on that hey hi marty long indeed long time not long time no speak or it's, it's with you. i have spoken to uh to your son but not to you so yeah great question and absolutely true and it's why some of our other some of the you know not all the buildings that we that i showed you would decompose back into the soil. That particular one, I hope, will, because it is built right in the heart of a, you know, incredibly sensitive environment that really oughtn't to have any buildings or, or human footprints in it. Or if the footprints are there, they should, you know, yeah, blow away on the wind. And so I think that idea of a building being able to decompose and disappear is legitimate. You, you are correct that that means then you have to use energy somewhere to build another building, you know, that, so there's, an energy, there's a sort of net energy thing that's a, that's a question. And it's why you might, in a different environment, and I think that Kenyan environment was such, where you're standing on a ranch land, it's had a human footprint for quite a long time, and actually there, potentially, you want to build a building that actually will be sustainable in other ways, and need very little further investment, maintenance, or anything else and might stand there and be the icon it is for generations that equally has a, a, a you know, they each have a, a, a conservation and sustainability merit. And I, and I think different places require a different response. You would always in an urban context, for example, surely it must be that you want to produce buildings that will last for a very long time and that won't, as is the sort of Johannesburg, uh, or you know, sort of South African thing, you know, have to be knocked down and and smashed up and rebuilt every thirty years. So I do. So point well taken, and I think you take a different approach. Yeah, I think diff each different approach is valid in different places. And then maybe just a comment on the materiality side of things. It's always a fine line that you're walking on. You want to use materials that are robust and sort of weatherproof, but also kind to the environment. So. You, Often the things that last the longest are the most unkind to the environment. But, you know, if you're using completely natural things, sometimes the insects do affect them or they, you have to rebuild it again. So I think it's on the same sort of line. So it's a absolutely exactly. And if maybe maybe that maybe having maybe building something that's unkind once, you know, is not as bad as building something that's unkind you know, again and again and again. And of course, sustainability is not just about materials. I mean, that's really the, the point. You know, sustainability, the real issue of sustainability is, is the environment in which these buildings are placed. Can that be sustained? That's a much more important question than whether the building is sustainable. And usually in, in our industry or in this industry, the whole 
almost the whole point, not entirely the whole point. There's somewhere deep down there's an economic motive in this as well. But there's a very clear rationale that if you can, if, uh, you know, um, if an industry, a tourist industry, hospitality industry, can protect an environment and, and provide value and enhance value, then that environment can be sustained. So, and that's true of not, I don't think that's true only of the hospitality industry. I think that's true, you know, ev everywhere. It's not just about the building. Great, right. thank you. And I think, uh, Colleen, you can unmute yourself and ask your question because I think your question in the chat follows on very, very nicely from this conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Ben, I, I, I commented quite a bit and had a few questions. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, you, you've done an amazing job of looking at sustainability and I'm loving what One Planet stands for. Uh, and I just wanted to find out, have you found that you're shifting more to regenerative principles? How can you add more regenerative principles? Because uh, you're looking at going from three planet to one planet, but what about if it is about regenerating? so that it's not about one planet, but it's not having any impact on the planet and even regenerating what it is. So that's the first question. Mm -hmm. And the second question is, are more lodges coming on board? Are you finding that there is, um, you've been able to uh, get other communities, for example, from, from what you were doing in London? Are, are you finding that more people are coming on board now? Are you able to mimic that in other areas? Or are these a one-hit wonder? Brilliant, thanks. Um, fantastic questions. I mean, I think so on the issue of re re regenerating. So with COP26 in Glasgow, that the, the message we we had there was about adapt and regenerate. And I think it's, I suppose, when the One Planet Living framework was set up and sorry if this was you know, slightly pessimistic there was the view that we you know we were going to mitigate the worst impacts of, of climate change whereas i think now we have to you know acknowledge that that chance has, has passed and we have to adapt to those uh those impacts and look at how we can regenerate the, the planet so I mean, nick talked about rewilding on some of the sites he, he was on and yeah i mean that's it you know exactly what what we need to do is is look at how we can return more land uh, to nature and i think that's you know part of that is is us understanding where our you know where our impacts arise and it's yeah not just about the buildings and the um and the uh, transport we have but all of the the, the goods and, and services we use and their impacts el elsewhere so yeah i mean completely uh, agree that we need to look at more regenerative approaches in the buildings can we you know, it's in some of these smaller developments embedding timber is is using timber and making um carbon negative buildings is 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 feasible you know, we need to make that mainstream we, we need to stop using cement full stop and, and be you know, simply be using bio construction materials so that we can we can take uh, carbon out of the, out of the atmosphere but where's all that timber going to be grown how's that going to be done sustainably it's it's, it's a huge uh, challenge are more people coming on board? I think in is yes, but I think there's some certain issues I feel have and, and it depends where you are have, have really been resolved to a degree. So looking at a, a project we're working on in the UK, you know, there's still a huge focus on making the building energy efficient, and yet when we looked at the lifetime impact of the project. The building energy was a few percent of, of that mm -hmm. um, because the, the grid in, in Europe is pretty green now. The, there was the buildings are efficient. Yeah, most of the impact of the building was the materials that go into building it. The stuff that goes into to fitting it out and then, you know, the people who live in it and their, and their choices uh, they make in their life. So yeah, more and uh, more people are coming on board, but maybe not seeing the full picture of what that what that means uh, and that it's not just about you know, making a, an efficient building it's it's much it's much larger than that right thank you can i chip in i, I just yeah. thought, just a thought on that and because I, I, I think your question originally d did reference the lodge industry not just the, the sort of building industry at large which obviously is much more 
complex thing. It's worth noting that the lodge industry, uh, different to, to some other hospitality sectors, the, uh, well, it may appear otherwise now, the original intention was not necessarily hospitality. It had been, it made, a lot of the lodge industry was born out of conservation and almost all the founders, certainly the founder of St. Gita, founders, founders of St. Gita's competitors, they were all deep conservationists who kind of reversed into hospitality as a means to preserving the environments where they were and then expanded those businesses into, into new and other environments. So I, I, it was just, I remember the question sort of referencing lodges specifically and so I think they are unique in that way perhaps, but yeah, finding a kind of a symbiotic relationship between it all is, is I suppose, where we're trying to go, you know. Thanks for that. Mike, I see you have your hand up. You can unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, thank you both Nick and Ben. Uh, very fascinating talks and amazing to see what can be done with good planning. I just wanted to find out, because I come from the water industry, um, what's done on site for sewage treatment? Do you need, do you use modern technology to treat and recycle the water, the, the sewage? Do you put it back into the environment or, yeah, I'd just like to find I out. So should, it, should I answer for, for a start? The answer, the answer is, is yes, the technology just isn't that modern though. It's actually very old technology <laughs> because it, you know, the principle is, is very, very simple, which is you, 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 and there are a couple of different ways of doing it. There are a couple of different uh, manufacturers, but they all work the same way. They all encourage a sort of aerobic and anaerobic bacterial treatment of uh, sewage and waste. And absolutely, I mean, you can get that water back to being completely reusable if need be. But at the very least, and definitely all of our projects, we, we are obliged to do it by environmental impact assessments, all of that kind of thing. So, so there's no question that, that it gets done. And usually that, that uh, effluent, once it's been through one of those systems, is at least passable back into the environment. It isn't necessarily potable, not for human beings necessarily, because there are, there are other treatments that would need to happen to it. But, it's very, but it is close to it, and it is certainly acceptable for discharge into the bush or yeah, if that's an answer. Thank you. Thank you. I would yeah. say, yeah, no, nothing to, to add. Well, no, one minor point to add. So um, on, yeah, the, this ancient technology. So, so Bed said uh, in, in, Lon in London, we designed that wanting to be kind of more autonomous and had the uh, water treatment system on site but actually found that I think it used three or five times more energy than just putting the water into the mains because that treatment system is, it's, it's also a biological it's treatment already. system. Yeah. It's there already. It's, it's worked at a much larger, larger level. So just as sort an of urban example of <laughs> to, to go with the, the, the yeah. rural ones. Yeah, I should imagine there, there's no shortage of water in the UK, so, or not, a, yeah. But in, in an urban environment in, in Africa, uh, sorry. Increasing in the southeast, there's yeah, significant water shortages. It's um, yeah. Okay. No, oh, thank you. Thank you very much for the answers there. Great. I'm going to allow one or two more questions, depending on the length of the answer. Uh, Colleen, you can unmute yourself. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for your previous answers. As you were talking, I was just wondering, the examples you've given are quite affluent, and we're at a cusp we're at the cliff edge of, of a planetary crisis. How could the designs, are, is there interest, are, have we got projects? Is there an acceleration of bringing this into less affluent spaces so that we can actually, yeah, move forward? Just uh, wondering. Thank you. Yeah, That's a, that. <laughs> I, I might have been on that first. I, I'll um, I might chip in off. Yeah, no, I mean, I think so. In um, if you're from a sustainability perspective, looking at how we you know, produce co consumption globally, then you know we need to look at the high consumers, who are the, who are the kind of wealthy, um, wealthy in the world. So that that's that's an answer of why there's a, a focus there. But I think, you know, you're, you, we, we, 
with One Planet Living, we're always trying to explain that you know the goal in developing in developed countries, over-consuming countries, is that they need to reduce their consumption down to a sustainable level while maintaining a, a high standard of living. In in countries with sort of developing economies, then it, it's around uh, increasing their standard of living, the the healthcare, access to education, literacy, safe working environments, etc. Et while you know, while remaining within a, a sustainable consumption level, but but acknowledging their uh, their consumption level should be increasing, um, that that needs to be I mean, that needs the model needs to allow that to happen. So, yeah, I, I mean a complex <laughs> complex I I issue. I hope that's some some answer. The tourism is making you know just to add the tur tourism is about making those connections, isn't it? It's just about connecting people who can travel and 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 the the more affluent people in uh, you know um, side of the world with with environments generally which are which are much less affluent by whether at a human level or or you know even at a non-human level but so and making i think that tourism does that and i think that organizations it is certainly true of singita and it is true of some of the singita's competitors for whom i work Making those connections, bringing people from the affluent side of the of, of the planet to the less affluent, you know, creates huge uh, benefits just in terms of awareness, bringing funding, and yeah, so so there's a bridging that happens in the process. Thank you. I was not going to be able to answer that question, but maybe uh, Colleen, we we are going to have a, a session on regenerative communities next year in March, so. I'll, I'll definitely take your question into development around around the topic then. So I'm gonna do my closing slides. On the screen, you'll see some of the ideas for next year's uh, December. We're obviously on a break. We're gonna regenerate over the holidays and come back uh, full of energy again. And in January, we're gonna have a talk around building with earth. In February, we're gonna have a, a topic around regenerative residential design. In March, we're looking at regenerative communities. And in April, I'm thinking around healthy and happy buildings, which was a topic uh, put forward by Tebby. So thank you for that. Again, if you have an idea, let us know what you want us to talk about and we'll make it happen. Again, if you haven't, Somebody in mind that wants to sponsor us, let us know. We are, can always use some little extra money to organize these webinars. And then lastly, I would really like to thank our speakers of today, Ben and Nick, very much. There were so many positive messages in the chat, uh, really great presentations, a lot of inspiring messages and inspiration of, you know, how we can, how, the high-end ecologists are trying to do the right thing and also how to use the One Planet uh, or One Living Planet um, framework is working. Thank you very much for your time and efforts to be here today. And then again, if you've missed any of our previous webinars, you can go to Greenet at RCSA and they uh, are all there for you to watch again. And with that, I'd like to close this webinar. Again, thank you for all for attending really appreciate it and I hope to see you in the new year on a different topic. Thank you so much and have a lovely evening. All right, thanks, thanks very much. Much thanks, enjoyed. Bill. Thanks, Nick. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.